So this is a uh, joint work with, uh, with Matthias, uh, Enrica Masson, and Nick McCleary. And uh, it's going to be, as I said, it's going to be about real Monsham pair equations, but uh, I want to start in this uh, concrete, complex uh, geometric problem. Uh, so we're going to fix a generic uh, um, homogeneous polynomial of degree d plus 2 uh, in d plus 2 variables. Uh, and then we fix a number s, a non-zero complex number, and then we look at the zero set in p d plus 1, which is uh, this equation here. So you see I used my polynomial f here, and then I have this uh, product of the coordinate functions uh, as well. And I'm, I call this xs. Um, and uh, the, um, the, que the question I want to ask here is what, what happens then uh, as s tends to zero? I have, uh, so in, in some sense, I, I, was, I was careful up here to say that S0 is a non-zero complex number. So another way of packaging this is to say that we have some, some, some object X, which really lies into in the product here of C star PD plus one. Um, on the other hand, this uh, central fiber we have here is gonna play a central role in what comes. Uh, so, so the question is then what happens as s tends to zero and I, in the in the one dimensional case I have this uh, this image of what's happening. In the one dimensional case we just have elliptic curves. So we have these tori and then as s tends to zero or at least as when s equals to zero we just have this union of three hyperplanes. So this is somehow the process but uh, I want to I want to be a bit more precise about the question here. Uh, so uh, we have an embedding into p d plus one. That means we have a class, a particular class, and all of my excess, which means, and that they're also going to be Calabi Jiao. So each of these, I can equip them with a Calabi Jiao metric, and then I can ask the question: What happens as s tends to zero in a metric sense? And when I say also metrically here, uh, I mean not just as metric spaces, but also in terms of the Calabi-Yau structures on these manifolds. Uh, and there are, there are two conjectures then uh, that predicts what's gonna happen when uh, S tends to, tends to zero. The first one is called the stroming yau sastov conjecture. And it says that uh, for small for small s, these calabi manifolds are going to be vibrations over something smaller. Uh, vibrations over something smaller, in, in some sense, much simpler. So for small s, these uh, calabi manifolds admits a special Lagrangian torus vibration. Again, if we look at the uh, the one-dimensional case here, uh, we just have elliptic curves. And then these vibrations are, are very simple. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, if we have our elliptic curve here, then this just corresponds to the fact that we have an S1 vibration over S1. Uh, we can also draw this, uh, of course, as a quotient of the complex plane. Um, so we have, uh, 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 so each excess then is a, is a quotient of the complex plane by uh, the group generated by one and some generator tau, where tau depends on s. Uh, so something like this. And then we, we get our vibration here by, by just projecting down. So we have a vibration over s1. Um, as the s tends to zero, this is going to degenerate in some sense. And, and what's going to happen here is that uh, one of the uh, generators of this lattice is gonna is gonna converge to zero, or at least up to rescaling, uh, it's gonna converge to zero. It, one feature of this picture on the right here is that uh, when we represent our elliptic curves in this way, uh, the calabi yau metrics are very visible. The calabi yau metrics are sort of the ones you get by just inheriting the metric from C. Um, so. If this generator here tends to zero, that would somehow correspond to 
the these uh, fibers collapsing with respect to the Calabria geometry. So, so there is uh, that's another uh, there is another conjecture there which says that s tends to zero as s tends to zero the size of these fibers is going to be much smaller compared to the base so up to normalization if we normalize to make sure the diameter of the spaces is constant then these uh, fibers are going to collapse so in this case we started with an elliptic curve and then in the limit we got yes yes s1 Uh, so more precisely, than, or, or this is often called the conservative Scheubelmann conjecture or the Gross-Wilson conjecture, and that says that uh, up to normalization, I haven't written up to normalization, but uh, up to normalization, these uh, metric spaces will grow more house or converge to a metric of Monshard pair type on the base. So let, let me say just a few things about what these things mean here. Um, so first of all, uh, the base here. So we start with something of complex dimension D and the base is gonna have, uh, it's gonna have real dimension D. Uh, and if part of, well, part of the conjecture is that, that at least in the general case, uh, the base is gonna be topologically a sphere. Um, moreover, it's going to be um, it's also somehow expected that this is going to have something called an integral fine structure. So there is some more structure to it than just a topological sphere. But what do you mean by the base here? Are you, assume, are you assuming here that this is a hydration of Yes. So, in this is in a, in a conjectural sense. This is what this is a, in a conjectural sense. So, this is what is expected then. Okay. So, it's an addition. Exactly. Um, it's also well um, more things expected about the base. Uh, one thing that's expected about the base is that it's going to be the uh, uh, dual intersection complex of something. Which in this case is just going to be this central fiber we had before. Uh, so what do I mean by the dual intersection complex? Uh, well, it's um, the central fiber. Let's say we, we draw this in again, D equals one. Then we are at the central fiber, we had these three hyperplanes. Um, and to draw the dual intersection, intersection complex of this, I, I start by looking at all the uh, intersections, the deepest intersections. Uh, I got three of them here. Uh, sorry, that's not what I do. For, for, each, for each of these divisors, H1, H2 and H3, uh, I, 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 put, I put a vertice here. And then for each intersection, uh, I add a edge between them. So in this case, then, the, this dual intersection complex, it is the boundary of a triangle. In general, we get general dimension, we're gonna get a simplex. Boundary of a synthesis. Thank you. Uh, moreover, then there is this word called Montampere type here. And uh, by that, so we're going to have some, some, this base is going to be equipped with some kind of Riemannian metric. And this metric, uh, to say that it is of Montampere type, means that it's going to be locally of the form, uh, locally something which is the second derivative of a convex function. Uh, so with a convex function, which actually solves then a real Montampere equation. 
so this this is going to be defined on the base. So down here. Uh, so the, the the base is the dual graph, or is expected to be the dual graph. So here, what we have here then is a motion pair equation on the boundary of the triangle. Does that, does that answer your question? That's a very yes. Yeah, so that's that's a very good follow up question. Like, or, or you mean? Uh, in, in what sense can we make sense of this equation on this type of object? What dimension is this? So this is this is a d equals to one. So we have. So this is d equal to one. So the boundary is going to have dimension d. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me so yes the constant. Uh, yes, yes, a positive constant. More questions? Yes. So the core index has to be zero. Is there also a real one on it? No, it's just here. It's just the real one only appears. Yeah. So I guess at this point we can forget about the vibration and just focus on, on this graph, right? Uh, yeah, you could you could do that, yeah. At this point in this slide, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh one one more thing I should mention as well is that uh, with respect to this uh, uh, conjecture about these um, vibrations is that the, the the it's expected that there is well, well there, there will be singular fibers in these vibrations um, so uh, in some sense what what in the very strongest form of this conjecture you would you want a special Lagrangian torus vibration on some kind of uh, Perhaps a co-dimension to subset or so. So, okay. So this is really the motivation. That's where uh, <laughs> this thing. Um, we, and then and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is uh, these real motion pair equations on this. Uh, let Let me go back one one more time here. Um, so we, we have the, we have this uh, kind of uh, uh, we have this we have a, a few different descriptions of the base here. On the one hand, we have a description of what the topology is supposed to be. Uh, there's also going to be something called an integral affine structure on it. There's also some kind of uh, simplicial structure on it here. And I, I'll try to I'll try to kind of explain a little bit about how these things fit together. Uh, and I'll also talk about the real mountain pair equation on this thing. Uh, and kind of the goal of the talk is to, I, I want to get, uh, is the following result here, explain that the, uh, the real mountain pair equation on the boundary of the unit simplex admits a solution. Uh, and uh, this is going to, the uh, the data defining my real motion pair equation is going to have to be symmetric. That's a necessary condition. Uh, I'll also say something of what of stuff I will not talk about, but which is important for the context. So solutions to this equation. So these these, these are somehow solutions to an honest real motion pair equation. Uh, they uh, induce uh, non-Archimedean metrics, which solve the non-Archimedean motion pair equation. And I'm not trying to say that the non-Archimedean motion pair equation is not honest, but uh, uh, there is still uh, uh, having such a description of solutions to the non-Archimedean motion pair equation is quite significant. Uh, in particular, uh, having such a description of solutions to the non-Archimedean motion pair equation allows uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, allows us to prove uh, a generic version of the of this SYC connection. So if you 
So, so with this, you can construct the generic special Lagrangian torus vibration. So by generic, they, I mean that they are not, the, they're not defined on a uh, co-dimension two or dense subset, but really you have a vibration on a subset of 99% of the Calabria volume. Uh, so this, this last part here is, is really ideas and results by Yang Li uh, in a couple of papers from 2020. And um, well, yeah, so, so we have, uh, have this image down here. Uh, uh, so, so on the left side here, we have this non Archimedean world. Uh, on the right hand side, we have uh, what I'll talk about now, which is something called integral affine manifolds or tropical manifolds. Um, and, and you, what Matthias talked about. Uh, this Monday was the non-Archimedean world and non convention pair equations in the non-Archimedean world. And, and what I'm gonna, so he kind of started building a bridge here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start in this world, with these integral affine manifolds. And I'm gonna start building a bridge in the other direction. And I'm not quite gonna be able to connect these two. Connecting these two would in some involve telling this story as well, which I'm excluding here. But I, I hope to kind of illustrate in some sense, how different the how different flavor these two subjects are, um, and also the fact that somehow by connecting these two things, you can it can, it can be quite uh, quite useful to connect them. Okay, uh, so this uh, well, for, yeah. So what is the real motion pair equation? So. Uh, when you talk about real motion pair equation, you usually start with some kind of, uh, with, with a convex function defined on Rn or a subset of Rn. Uh, and uh, let's say that your, con that your function is uh, smooth. Uh, that would mean that, yeah, if your function is smooth, then you define the real motion pair just as the determinant of the second derivative of your function. Uh, and I'm adding a volume form here because I want my real motion pair to be a measure. There is, so this is the classical definition. And then there is also the weak definition, which is in some sense quite classical as well. It's due to Alexandrov. Um, so here, here we just need phi to be a lower semi-continuous convex function. Uh, and then the Monchamper measure of phi is defined by saying that uh, uh, if I, Take a measurable set and plug it into my motion pair measure, then what I get is exactly the volume of the gradient image of A. Is that, uh, should I say, should I say upper symmetry? Yeah, yeah. So, so there could be an issue on the. You can you can think about continuous, yeah, definitely. So in yeah, in general, if you have a, you could have a, you could allow it to take in infinite values, in, in particular on the boundary of your domain. If you have a domain, you you want it to to be lower semi continuous. Uh, I'm not going to say more about this. But there is one observation I want to make, and that is that this is uh, uh, SL, SL, SLDC invariant. And uh, by that I mean that if I, it's invariant on the maps on this for, of this form. And uh, but it's just, there's many ways to see that. You could sort of just compute explicitly what you get if you apply an affine transformation here. You could also look at the, at the weak definition. And if I apply an affine transformation to Rn, then uh, it's going to correspond to applying the inverse transformation to Rn duo. And if my affine transformation is volume preserving, it's not going to change the volume in the duo. So, so this, this is really 
what you have here is really invariant under these, these kind of maps. So we cannot really talk about real motion pair equations just on smooth manifolds. We need some extra structure. And what the, the extra structure we need is going to be related to this system. So the extra structure we need is an integral affine structure. Um, so if we, if we have a topological manifold X uh, and D is the real dimension of X, then an integral affine structure is a special atlas on this topological manifold where the transition functions lie in this, in this group. Uh, equivalently, it's a smooth structure together with a flat torsion-free connection with uh, holon holon holonomy in this, in this group. Uh, so just one, uh, there's one observation we can make then is that we have, uh, if you have this kind of structure, then you, have a, then you have a connection, which means you have a notion of geodesics. You have also have a notion of parallel transport. but you have no notion of distance. Uh, so in particular, these connections does not have to come from a Romanian metric. So, so it's a, a um, in that sense, it's a much more general object than a Romanian manifold, but it's also special in the sense that your connection is flat and torsion free. So, this, this condition that is flat and torsion free is going to mean that the holonomy is going to be locally constant, but you can have global holonomy on your manifold. And uh, uh, the global holonomy could be sort of, it could be outside of the orthogonal group, which means that if you parallel transport vectors around, uh, they might grow in size when you return to the point where you started. That can give some kind of <laughs> disturbing phenomena. You're saying that X is just a topological manifold, right? Yep. And uh, still a classical atlas. So that accounts for the corners in the picture before. Um, not quite. So I'll get, I'll, I'll get to. I'll, I'll actually, uh, as an example, I'm going to write down an explicit integral affine structure on the unit boundary of the unit system. But that's a that's a very interesting okay. question. Yep. Exactly. Is there any connection to this structure with those properties? Um, I don't. I don't know. Um, I mean the the. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Eudesics and and parallel transport are well defined. So. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. Sometimes there's a unique uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know actually. Um, okay, so right, we will also talk about singular like, integral affine structures. Uh, so that's sort of loosely connected with the fact that the these uh, special Lagrangian torus vibrations are expected to have singularities. Uh, it's also expected then that the uh, integral affine structure is going to have singularities. So this particular atlas. Uh, by mistake, I've written tropical atlas, but I mean integral affine atlas. So, uh, it, it doesn't cover entire X, it covers everything except for a small set. Uh, and and in, in, so by small set here, uh, I mean co dimension two. So in its general form, then, this is a very general object here. We don't know, essentially, we don't know anything about the singularities more than the co-dimension. Uh, okay, and an important point is that every reflexive polytope admits a singular tropical, uh, in, uh, so, so tropical is a slightly stronger uh, notion than integral, uh, integral affine. Uh, so, so yeah. Every reflexive polytope admits a, a singular integral affine structure on its boundary. Uh, so, so I'm gonna. Well, what's the reflexive? So, uh, the reflexive polytope is a polytope, uh, a lattice polytope whose dual is also a lattice polytope. 
fan of Gordon Stein, fan or, or something like that. So they're not necessarily smooth the toric manifolds. Uh, okay. Uh, and I, I, we talked before about the unit simplex uh, and from the perspective of, as a lattice polytope, there are actually more than, there are several unit simplices. Uh, and the one, I'm gonna let delta here be the, uh, in some sense, the, uh, a standard uh, unit simplex, or at least a standard unit simplex if you come from complex geometry. So delta here is really the polytope corresponding to uh, D plus one dimensional projective space. Uh, the uh, simplex we're interested in is the dual of this. So it's the, uh, yeah. Right, uh, and then I, I, I promised you I was going to give you an explicit um, integral affine or in, in fact actually a tropical atlas on the boundary of this uh, unit simplex. And I'm going to do this in dimension uh, when the dimension of the unit simplex is free, which means the boundary of the unit simplex has dimension two. Uh, so uh, this this uh, atlas then is not going to cover the entire unit simplex. It's going to be some singular points. And these singular points are going to be the midpoints of the edges here. So that's where we have our singularities. You would, maybe you would expect at first glance that the singular points would be the vertices or something like that. But in fact, the singularities, well, they're expected to always have co-dimension too. So they cannot always be the vertices. In fact, they're going to be something which sort of splits, oh, sorry, something that splits uh, co-dimension one edges into pieces. Uh, and we're going to get one coordinate chart for each vertex of our polytope. Uh, so if you fix a vertex, vertex V1, then uh, my coordinate chart is going to cover all the blue stuff here. So the interior of all the facets that contains V1, together with so all these interiors, together with half of these edges here. So we end up with this kind of shape. Uh, and if, if you do this for all the vertices, then you're going to exclude exactly the midpoints of the edges. And I've also written down what the coordinate functions are. If you have a vertex, vertex then you can look, then you can pick, uh, well, this is, the vertex is going to be a lattice vector. And then you can take its orthogonal complement. Um, and uh, you take, two generators for this, or you take generators for this orthogonal complement, and this is gonna define, well, it defines a function. It defines functions on this, uh, uh, on this boundary, and that, that's, those are exactly the functions you're using. So in some sense, you're just sort of looking at it from the perspective we have here and just projecting it down onto R2, but you're doing it in a uh, invariant manner, invariant with respect to SLD C. One, one interesting thing with this is that this is completely explicit, so you can compute the holonomy here. And as I said before, the holonomy is locally constant, but as I uh, circle around a singular point, I will get something non-trivial. And if you compute the holonomy there, you get uh, the following matrix, one, four, zero, one. And uh, here you, you can actually, here you can see some of the complex geometry because this is um, uh, this matrix to the power of four. And if you take four multiplied by the number of singular points, then you get 24, which is the number of singular fibers in a, in a generic uh, K3 vibration over S2. So, so you, in, a, in a generic case here, uh, you, you, you get sort of 24 singular points or singular fibers in your vibration. And what's happened here is that they have kind of come together in groups of, of four. Uh, 
And uh, I did I start on time or did I start? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. So what we want to do then is we want to solve the most real Mont Ampere equation on this. So we want sort of for each shard, we want to have a local convex function, uh, which solves the Mont Ampere equation in this shard. Uh, and then uh, we want, when I take these local convex functions and put them together, I want them to sort of, the second derivative should, should define a Riemannian metric. That's these metrics of Mont Ampere type. So they, in some sense, there's a compatibility right here. And on the overlap of the shards, these local convex functions need to um, need to uh, agree up to yeah in a certain manner. Uh, and then I wanted to say something uh, something before I sort of state the main theorem. Uh, I think the main theorem is really that we can solve this equation. Uh, and then there is some technical aspects of how to actually state the theorem in detail, but the main theorem is really that we can solve it. So, so I want to take the, the last couple of minutes just to say something about how we solve it. Because I was talking about these two world, worlds before, these two uh, banks of this river. We had a non archimedean world, and we had the, um, this uh, integral affine world. Uh, so, and uh, it, you, could, you could say, lacking a better word, you could say that the non archimedean world is a bit uh, non existent or mysterious. There are powerful theorems there that tells you that you can always solve the motion pair equation, but uh, it's not quite clear if the, motion, the non archimedean motion pair equation is, for example, a locally defined partial differential equation or something like that. Um, on the other hand, in this integral affine world, uh, things are more concrete and the motion pair equations are actual, real, honest motion pair equations. But this uh, integral affine world is somehow too loose, uh, somehow too little structure to work with. You would expect that to, to be able to solve these problems, you have to inject some kind of algebraic information. And a priori, it's not quite clear how to do that into the integral affine world. Uh, and then, but this uh, with this slide, and I want to sort of speculate or say something about how we did it, and also, you know, maybe that can provide a speculation about how it can be done in general. So uh, I think this has this this uh, functional. We've seen it before. Yes. Um, so you know, or. All right, yeah, that's a great question. What is my measure mu on this uh, simplex that I'm talking about? Uh, on the one hand, we have this uh, uh, integral affine structure. So I have uh, the uh, transition functions in my atlas, they're volume preserving. That means there is uh, up to constant, there is a well-defined measure on this. I just take Lebesgue measure and then uh, I need to normalize it. I just take Lebesgue measure in one chart and it's gonna be compatible. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you inject this non archimedean perspective, this is also the, uh, is, is in a sense, it's the weak limit of Calabi Jao volume forms. So, uh, right, so, so, so we looked at this functional before. Uh, this is the, in some sense, uh, this is a way to find uh, solutions to the real motion pair equations on RM. We, it's a function the dependent on phi here. So we just, if we want to solve this equation here, we uh, integrate phi against mu, and then we integrate phi star against uh, so new. I'm calling it new p here. So so new p here is uh, the uh, if you're for example in the toric setting, this is the uh, uniform measure or the Lebesgue measure restricted to a polytope. So, so this is how you solve this, how you solve motion pair equations in uh, in a toric setting. Uh, the, this, I, I, I understand. I understand your concern. It was not not intentional, no. 
D. This is this should all be D. And, and uh, yeah, and this, I'll keep this as an M. Okay. <laughs> That's solving the motion per equation on R M exactly. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so, so so we want to solve the real motion pair equation on the boundary of a simplex. Uh, so so then it makes sense to replace this with just the boundary of the simplex. More precisely, uh, I think I denote it delta G1 where we wanted to solve it. Um, but on the other, on the other hand, we have these two objects, which is sort of unclear how to replace. How do we replace the dual? And how do we replace the pairing here, which we need to define this, uh, this uh, uh, Legendre transform, which is essential here. <clears throat> this, uh, this uh, if we ask somebody, many people, if you ask them what this is, they would not say that this is, this comes from toric geometry or anything like that. They would say that this is something connected to optimal transport. Uh, so this is a, uh, uh, this is the Kantorovich dual uh, optimal transport problem. And uh, if we look at that, we, we can sort of get some inspiration because uh, uh, the uh, optimal transport problem, I, I'll just quickly say what, what kind of, what, what, uh, what data defines an optimal transport problem. Uh, it's really a, a source space Um, together with a probability measure and a target space together with a probability measure and some kind of cost uh, and a cost function on, uh, uh, on the product here. Then the optimal transport problem, it consists of sort of transporting the measure mu to the, trans the measure nu, somehow minimizing this cost. But the details are not so important here. I just want to make an analogy. Uh, because the problem we had up here was that we had no way to, we couldn't figure out like, what is the dual in this integral affine world? And also what is the pairing in this integral affine world? In the world of optimal transport, these have really natural answers. The dual, that's the target space. In other words, this Y down here. And uh, the pairing, that's just the cost function. So uh, optimal transport give this way of thinking of RD and RD dual as something sort of more, uh, yeah, as something uh, more general. Uh, so what, what we will do here is we will, we're gonna, we, yeah, so, so the question is then what is a, a suitable target space? And it turns out that the suitable target space in this case is just the boundary of the, the units, well, of the, of the other units in place. So I'm solving my equation on the boundary of, uh, so we have two simplexes. We have the standard simplex, which is delta, and we're solving the Montchamp pair on this dual, delta V. And uh, the target space is just going to be the boundary of, of delta. Um, and the, um, uh, the pairing, well, we, we have a natural pairing between these two, so we can just keep this here. Strictly speaking, in sort of in the language of optimal transport, you, you, because you don't want to take the supremum over all of RD here, then you just want to take the supremum over this space, and then, then it's usually called a C transform in optimal transport, so I'll have to replace this with a C. But apart from that, this is really, this is what we minimize when we're solving this equation. Uh, 